Um, so we're at that at that happy time um, now at, at five. I have eight slides to go through, and, and it won't it won't surprise you that there's one for each panel. Um, what Dan and I wanted to do was to try to capture some of the things, and there's been a lot discussed here, obviously, um, but at least some that we could we could discuss a little bit and, and be sure people agree with at least the way they're formulated here. This is not going to be the entire output of the, of the workshop, of course. Um, as I understand it, the, uh, the coordinating center has been capturing the chat, so those of you who are saying snarky things will all, will all know that. Um, <laughs> and, and in addition, I, I guess we should have told you when we, when we started, um, but we did have this plan as a as a you know a recorded session with a you know webcast and all that when we were in person and since we've been sort of partly in person and partly you know in vitro um, we our, our web team has managed to capture a fair amount of the discussion along with the slides as they were presented so um, should particularly those who are taking notes want you know want to go back and, and read or listen to some of the discussions they'll, they'll be available I think we started that at about 11 in the morning so we missed a couple of them but um, but we, we did it as quickly as we could given that we had to adapt. Um, so, so with that, maybe I'll, I'll just start with the first panel, and um, Dan, my partner in crime, can, can kind of comment when I get something wrong, but we, we did our best to try to capture these things. So, um, so we did hear a fair amount at the beginning about the tension between research and implementation, um, and you know, do we want to do perfect research, which we you know, might call a randomized clinical trial, versus really perfect implementation is something that's truly ready and has, has the evidence base behind it. Um, and I think later on, on the point was made, forgive me, I've forgotten who made it, maybe it was Mary, um, that, that we could have research or clinical implementation or research on clinical implementation. And, and it's the lab, the, the research on clinical implementation that's probably the sweet spot for Emerge. Who was it who said that, by the way? Maybe you're not still on. This is Julie. I think I brought that up. Julie, yes, okay. Yeah, I was thinking, no, that wasn't Mary. But anyway, so, so that's probably a, a sweet spot for Emerge and something we should consider. Pragmatic clinical trials is another, another term for that, but there are other uh, terms for it as well. Um, we, we recognize that learning healthcare systems are already doing this kind of work. They, they do the research as well as the implementation, and they make their care systems better. Uh, I think everyone recognized that there's um, perhaps a, a dearth of expertise in quality improvement, uh, potentially clinical workflow, possibly dis dissemination and implementation science, although we do have Mark Williams, and if he doesn't count for five of just about anything, I'm not sure who does. Um, so. At any rate, uh, that seemed to be a, a concern or a suggestion as well. Um, we did recognize the unique opportunities Emerge has for recalling participants who have uh, unusual uh, genotypes. And so having the genotype, we, we might be able to recall them given that we have the large numbers. We're also uniquely positioned to address uh, penetrance, heritability, and pathogenicity, all seemed <laughs> very interesting uh, to the group. And it was recognized that we didn't need huge numbers to assess these. You could do it really in three or five people was suggested. Maybe you need a few more than that. Um, but you, you do need to find a few that have rare variants. So is there anything here that, that anybody would, would violently object to in terms of, of panel one's output? Uh, this is Mary. I guess I violently object to the last one. That we don't need huge numbers to assess um, things like penetrance, heritability, and pathogenicity. That's, that's what you would object to? Well, that was actually, uh, I think, almost a verbatim quote of, of Gail. In, yeah, I think, I, think, I think you need a huge sample size, but for each variant, you don't need huge numbers. Is, is that, can you agree with that? I think it depends. Are you trying to assess the clinical significance of the variants based on the phenotypes that you're observing in the EAM, EMRs? Well, for example, you know, a lot of the way we annotate now is we just look at the frequency in the EBS 6500, and if it's too frequent, it's just not pathogenic. And if you had 100,000 people, you could really fine-tune that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do see what you're saying, but don't you think that that's how we've gotten a lot of false positives in OMIM? By no, I think that's how we've gotten the false positives out of OMIM, is by finding out what the true allele frequencies are. Yeah for things that are relatively rare, but not ridiculously rare. And not rare enough. I guess the example that was given, the breast cancer example, I did not think was a good one. Because it's What's very common for three people to be able to have breast cancer before the age of 80. Yeah, I appreciate is, that. But if no one, if, if, if a bunch of people have the mutation, First of all, if it's just too common, then it's probably not pathogenic. It's too common for the disease. And by 
by individually reporting the phenotypes, this is going to have to be community source. We're not going to solve all of this in eMERGE. But by reporting our phenotypes associated with variants, we add to the community of information for variant annotation. Yes, for, I agree. The presence of the phenotype, but the absence of a common phenotype could be misunderstood then. The absence of a common, a common phenotype has to be taken in context of penetrance, which is often poorly understood for some of these conditions at a population level. Um, but it, it's still a huge amount of information. I mean, if you look at how valuable EVS 6500 has been for clinicians, it, I mean, I use it every week for clinics. I don't so, okay, okay so, so let me stop, and we'll, we'll let Mary and, and Gail continue this <laughs> discussion later. Um, but I, I did modify that bullet to, to suggest, you know, this is somewhat context-dependent, so maybe you don't always need to cover it. Uh, but you do need to find a few with rare variants. Perfect political. Okay. <laughs> I've been in government a long time. Well, but if you find two cases of something associated with a rare genotype, you know nothing. The only thing you know is you can put that in a big data bank and hope that other people find them. And I, so I'm on Mary. I, I agree with Mary that we you have to be careful about the words that we use. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we will continue to refine this. Yeah. No, it's a good good caveat. Yeah, it's pretty good. But, but Jerry. Yes. Terry, this is, this is Reed. I mean, to the extent that um, any families within eMERGE can be capitalized on, then you have an opportunity to look at uh, rare variants and mm -hmm. do, in essence, segregation, assuming that they are of right. reasonable penetrance. And, and that hasn't really been talked about. It obviously depends a lot on how good your family history data are in eMERGE. No, excellent point. Um, yeah, and I think we, we didn't even touch about touch on families here. We did and, a little. Well, family. we barely touched on families. Great. <laughs> 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 the vast but it is, and it's 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 Go ahead. Uh, well, well, I think the one thing that was missing in this whole discussion is no one talked about the study design for addressing penetrance. You know, are we talking about a prospective analysis? Are we talking about a case control analysis? So I, I'm not saying we should get into it at this point, but I think to address that question, you're going to have to talk about exactly the study design you want to employ to estimate penetrance. Okay. Excellent point. We will note that down. Um, yeah, as I, as I said, this is not the, the final word, but uh, we're trying to get, just as, you, as you've done, Neil and Mary, the, you know, the key issues we need to address. Okay, moving on to panel two, uh, EMR and clinical phenotyping. So I'm now hearing an, an echo in here, and it's gone. Thank you very much. All right, so EMR and clinical phenotyping, um, this, there was sort of strong consensus, it seemed, uh, which is hard to assess over the phone, but it seemed as though there was a feeling that eMERGE investigators should convene some kind of a forum with the clinical leadership of academic health systems to try to find some common ground for genetic, genomic medicine-related research. Uh, one of the things that they could then do is, is perhaps speak with a unified, unified voice to electronic medical record vendors. So it didn't seem like that was the only thing. That was just one, um, one issue. So, so that seemed to be, I'll, I'll just go through them. Um, and the point was saying that supporting genetics is often seen as a money loser, and, and we need to work to demonstrate the value proposition. Um, we would ensure, we, we also need to ensure when we deal with the um, uh, institutional leaders that, we, that there's a bi-directional information flow so that we understand what's important to them as well as what's important to us so that we then can get it. Um, and uh, we should explain how to use the EMRs for um, implementation, identify what they're ready to implement. So those are sort of the same thing. Are those, oh, and forgive me for using EMR, it's just when I type EHR, it always corrects it, and I haven't figured out how to fix that. So, so I really mean EHR. Um, any, any objections to this? So we had other research areas. Um, that Josh talked about when he went through. Many. Yeah, it was more than I could probably use. And, and, and these don't touch anything on the phenotyping. <laughs> I mean, they're all definitely directed at EMR, but there aren't any. Yeah, the modular phenotype part. Yeah, the modular. Oh, forgive me. There, there's actually several, and I could even email you. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Perfect. 
So, so this slide will be poor. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I just got caught up in this forum idea, you know, it's like, oh my god, how do we do that? Um, so, okay. Uh, so, so with Peggy's amendment that there's lots on, on phenotyping of research that needs to be done, are there other things, anything in here that people would object to? I don't object to anything on this list for sure. I, th I think there was strong agreement on this. is Josh, by the way. Um, the, the one thing I would uh, add, I felt like there's fairly strong consensus around the idea that we wanted to use the EMR, try to use the EMR in ways that was unique in terms of the phenotypes we addressed, longitudinal pharmacogenetics, something like yeah. that, that may you know leverage the 350,000 people we had. So. Okay, so I have, a, I, I have a, an action item to maybe work with Peggy and Josh and share the things I think yep. to, to, to come up with some, some better work. And we can actually, when Josh gets here, we'll meet and... Outstanding. Okay. okay. Thank you. Did you hear that, Josh? I did. Okay. All right, great. Um, so for panel three, uh, EMR was with discovery. Um, there, there was a strong feeling that the discovery research should remain a high priority um, and that we focus on the things that are, are unique or at least uh, unusual and uh, uh, heavily represented and emerged, such as the longitudinal phenotypes we talked about, et cetera. Um, we should address the importance of rare but collectively common variants, which obviously are for sequencing. Um, alternative designs for discovery should be considered. Uh, extreme discordant, discordant phenotypes, I guess, and the tails of distributions, I didn't see as really all that alternative. I mean, that's been done in genomics for quite some time, uh, but that was the comment that was made. Um, and we should also extend data, expand data collection processes to additional sources of DNA and possibly RNA, as well as data on environmental comorbidities. Objections to any of these? Uh, the thing came out with Hawkins' uh, idea of the chip. Would that, I, I got in a way with space because that cuts across both pediatric and genome. So it may be better put here. So I think that's a very interesting suggestion. So the suggestion of a chip for? You need to emerge. We've seen a lot of functions, yeah. DNA mm -hmm. lots of function very, very. So that was a loss of function. It's a better experiment would be the sequencing. Yeah. The better experiment would be sequencing because that those chips are not going to capture diverse populations. Yeah. And, and Debbie, Debbie was looking for sequencing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the question there is sort of the uh, the the timing right now versus uh, <clears throat> in about a year or two, you will have sequencing price come down uh, hugely with these sort of new technologies. Uh, so there's a window now for about a year and a half to do something uh, where I think a chip, chip could be very, very valuable. And, and you may in the end want a chip in any case. There's nothing wrong with genotyping somebody you sequence and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I, think. I mean, anything we're talking about now is, what, a year and a half away and in a year anywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, we really should be focusing yeah. on where the puck's going to be, not where it is right now. Se sequencing is where <laughs> okay, and anything, anything, any other objections to what's on here? And then omissions, major things that were left off. Other than that, chip was clear. Okay, good. All right. Only, so the only other thing I, I had was Marilyn Ritchie's observation that the Phoenix still gets yeah, especially oh, for right. gene environment yeah. interaction. Yeah. Oh, shame on me, Aaron Robinson. And Robert. putting in the... Uh, GIS information. Terry, this is Marilyn. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the only other thing I would say is, you know, if once NHGRI starts looking at, you know, budgeting and what can and can't be done in an RFA, um, we did talk a little bit about, you know, we think even without generating new data, there is more use of the data we have. Um, of course, we want to generate more data, but if in the end, we can't do additional sequencing or more data collection. You know, I, I think there is more to be mined out of what we have. So I think that shouldn't be lost. No, good point. Um, and I think John, John Harley made that point as well, that uh, we really have lots and lots of it. Yes, I mean, the phenotyping right now is the time obstacle. We have the GWAS genetic data is continuing to be updated in a very clean way. So if we're going to develop a phenotype to look at the sequence with, you would also want to run it through GWAS, because the data is there. Yeah. Okay. Phenotyping is much harder. Okay. 
Um, so panel four on genetic testing, um, we need to understand that the trade-offs potentially between the two-stage CLIA, you know, sort of where, where one qualifies or confirms in a, in a CLIA setting in a subset but doesn't do a, a CLIA uh, com uh, uh, compliant process in everybody versus sort of CLIA from the start of more universal process. Um, this was in, in discussion of the PGX uh, implementation at the various sites. Some sites went one way, some sites went the other. And I think we were urged by the group to try to understand, you know, what are the benefits and, and advantages and disadvantages of those two approaches. And we are probably in a good position to study that because we have the same platform, uh, many of the same outcomes, et cetera. And, and so, you know, uh, it's something we were advised to. Um, we uh, may also need to ensure consent, the consent, and as Sam referred to them, consent variants, so, so various uh, uh, ways that consent might be implemented, uh, that it allows deposition into the EMR. Um, the process of re reinterpretation of, the, of variants and, and understanding or re-annotation of variants is, is a researchable question. How does one go about that? Who has responsibility for it? How is it best done? What's the, the um, uh, frequency that, you know, that sort of type? Um, and the approach to recontacting uh, participants is also, or patients is also a researchable question. Many researchable questions came up. Um, and Heidi told us about the ACMG standards for clinical lab reporting that were something that we certainly should be considering or similar standards at least as they, as they develop um, should be followed obviously when we do emerge genotyping. Anything on there that people have trouble with? Yes, Kim. Yeah. So the last point separating the lab methods, which is what Heidi was talking about, versus the genomic testing recommendations of forced return and pediatric return. You're talking about the methods, but I just want to separate out Right, the return piece is not being something that I we do not like the reporting. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the, the, she actually referred to reporting, like what they report out, how they report it, in, in, in what format, and that's right, of, but not the actionable variant. Yeah, that's a separate piece of work they did. I just don't want them to be convoluted. Good. Other rejections? Are you all still there? Mark, you're not saying anything. I'll chime in when I've got something to say. There you go. Please don't ask Mark to, please don't ask Mark to say anything. <laughs> okay. And you're still dependent on me for a ride Friday. Keep that in mind. <laughs> ask Mark to say as much as he wants. There you go. Um, panel five on consent education and governance. Um, there were a lot of recommendations from this one, um, including we, we really need to assess the impact of point of care education. And again, you know, a recurring theme was how it's done. You know, when is it useful? Who provides it? That sort of thing. Um, um, Maureen, you know, strongly urged this, and we all agree to integrate family history into the EMR. We did an, an analysis within Emerge of the. Um, even the presence of family history information in the electronic medical records, and it was abysmal. It was like 90, you know, 20% or so of, of maybe three of the, of the providers. In MU2. Uh, pardon me? In MU2. Yes, yeah, and actually thanks to work that Greg Firo when he was here mm -hmm. that, that he did. Um, but we should facilitate interaction of LT research components across multiple networks. That, that is something that we struggle with, and, and I think we did quite well in the, in the first phase of emerge. Yeah. Maybe not as well this time um, because we were focusing more on implementation, but also because there was this whole return of results consortium that kind of sucked the oxygen out of the room um, when it came to, to LT. LC research well, and, and then they went yeah, left. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They left. LC was not in the room. Yeah, right. so, so hopefully we can find a way to, uh, to uh, deal with that in, in phase three. Yeah, they all signed off actually five p.m. Um, so it was pointed out there was little work in the legal arena. Um, there are CLIA and HIPAA issues among, uh, among many, many others um, that that are researchable and we could address. Uh, there are also economic issues that we probably aren't paying as much attention to as we could. We don't have the expertise. Um, engaging payers as stakeholders was a, another thing that was suggested. It probably hasn't been done uh, as well in in this group. Um, policy development uh, almost certainly is needed for effective implementation and something that we should we should try to pay, pay some attention to, not that we haven't. Um, and persistence of genomic data has unique policy applications. So the fact that, that, that I think this was, again, a more comment, um, that these data do persist throughout the lifetime, uh, one lifetime, and, and that has um, really, you know, there are very few other things that do that. Any objections to what's up here? No. Any additions to what's up here? 
I mean, I think the only thing I would note related to payers is that um, if, if you ask payers in general, um, they say, you know, well, we're not in the research business. Um, so I think as we think about engagement, we're going to have to be very thoughtful about what we're really engaging them to do. Okay. Terry, it's Susan. I have one uh, addition on legal. It's really easy to lapse into, you know, thinking of legal as the statutes, but legal here is also going to include liability, uh, which we talked about a little bit, and also the sort of human subjects regulatory context. Those are really important ads. Um, so when you say human subjects regulatory, that sounds a lot like statute to me. But um. no, I mean like the common rule and the advance notice for changing the common rule. Okay. And those, those aren't. I, I realize they're not technically statutes, but aren't they really similar? They're they're regs. I mean the human it's subjects regs are regs. Yeah. 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 How about regulatory? Liability and regulatory. How about that? Sure. Okay. Great. Yeah, so unfortunately, I go off the end of the slide, but you, you all won't mind. Um, so other additions, key additions? Okay. Uh, so, right, so the IRB collaborations are called site. So, right, IRB collaborations are called the emergency Yeah, that's something that we really haven't done. Yeah. Okay. With the IRB education. Education. Yeah, yeah. education and yeah. collaboration. Yeah, sort of non non-traditional IRB experiments. Yeah. yeah. So there's been two decades of central IRBs, and I don't think eMERGE has sufficiently different but the, the uh, issues that, it's gonna, it's gonna, that it needs to tra trod that entire path of you know, how you get IRB agreements and, and uh, central IRBs. Although the point was also made that there are a number of us that are also involved in the HMO research network that is currently actively engaging uh, in this discussion, so we could potentially leverage onto that. Well, and the CDRNs that just got are in the process of standing up have got a very rapid mandate to solve the IRB. Mm -hmm. What's the CDRN? The, the, the Corey's oh, network. Okay. Yeah, the Clinical Data Research Network, uh, PCORI. Okay, but, but maybe not. Thanks, Mark. You know, since there are many working in that um, in that space, maybe that might not be a, a unique place for emerge. Um, and, but there, there may be other places where there are, such as the clinical implementation. How do you get IRBs to understand how you do that? Yeah, the unique aspect may be related to the sensitivity around genetic and genomic data, which I don't think will necessarily be uh, covered by the other groups if somebody doesn't put it on their agenda. Mm -hmm. The other thing is IRBs are necessary for research. They're not necessary for clinical well, medicine. Yeah. So if we're looking at genomic medicine, then educating IRBs maybe, you know, got an obstacle in our path. Mm -hmm. No, no, I totally understand that. I mean, I, and I think it may be a space, and I think the CTSAs probably aren't focused enough on genomic research. Right, yeah. But you know, yeah. I think. And it's also the case that if ever, if ever you can imagine a set of institutions that don't uh, are not their IRBs are not afflicted by genetic exceptionalism, it would be emerge institutions. <laughs> so maybe they're not the model for generalizable solutions to the to the kind of arcane knowledge and the fact that IRBs go into reactive overprotectionism if they don't understand something. They don't understand the science because it's too complicated. Great. Then I also have to connect some teaching studies after mature results. Okay, we'll try and capture that. Maybe I, I can get it from later. Okay. All right. Good. All right, moving on. Um, on return of results, um, the point was made, and I think it's a good one, that Emerge really has an integrated infrastructure for empirical LT research, probably um, better than any other network. Um, we, we really have integrated it, you know, sort of part and parcel of, of Emerge. And so, yeah, return of results is a key topic, but there are many others, and we should, should pro probably try and take advantage of it. It's almost a law of some consensus um, uh, that, that panel, but at any rate, something that we should consider. Um, Highly penetrated periods seem very highly suited to return results investigations, um, and patients and institutions are interested in them, and because they recognize their liability and other issues, and there's little work ongoing in, in those. So, um, how can we kind of you know address the, the highly penetrated variants that, that are going to be rare, but still we'll have you know a substantial number of, of people with them in, in emerge. 
um, the point was made and well and well taken that we should ensure return on results studies include diverse populations. There's almost no work in, in that area to date. Um, and Emerge is well positioned to study the impact of patients having access to their own uh, electronic health record. Um, and we should use that to facilitate research and answer uh, new research questions. Any objections to anything here? I mean, give it on what the whole of the sequence of the AMG panel, but we also talked about broader sequencing and the implications that might have the next link to the line. For return of results. Right, yeah, yeah. in terms of the general results, that is genetically pediatric populations. And just that the, the issue is going to become much more complicated when it. You can explain that, and that, you know. But to get a highly concentrated variant, you can probably. Well, and I think the separation of return of data from return of interpretations is worth some note because it's really two different things. We also talked about finding actionability by um, developing some type of scoring grid. I mean, that was a part of this conversation. Well, more broadly than that, we talked about uh, comparing different approaches to actionability, some of which would query patients themselves and participants about what they regarded as actionable and desirable information. Um, but, but right, also Heidi talked about scoring systems that were more expert clinician driven. So I think comparing different approaches to actionability is going to really be crucial in this area. And particularly in the context of discussing par uh, potential partnerships with, uh, with PCORI, then we absolutely have to have the patient voice represented um, in this. I would also just modify the last bullet, Terry, to say patients having access to genomic information through their own EMR. I think there's, uh, can I add another thought, too? We did talk about looking at the issues raised by returning a proband's results to kin, to family. So I think that that's really uncharted work. Our R01 is on that, but they're, that's really coming up in a lot of studies. Um, Trust me to add it. I, I won't type it here. <laughs> we like to watch you type. Oh, you do? <laughs> no. Yeah, but it's 528, and, and I'll uh, continue to verify. Yeah, trust but verify. <laughs> we'll, we'll send these around and get to you. Okay. Anything? I'm sorry. Anything else on panel three? Hearing nothing. Panel seven on EMR integration. Um, there was a lot of talk about the open info button uh, approach and the standards that, uh, that nicely permit implementation in, in, in just about any EMR that uses those same standards. And so that's a sort of a readily transportable thing um, that, that people thought was good and we should continue. Um, patient, it was noted that patient's the only person in the healthcare system who is a constant. I think that's a direct quote part. Um, and, and so when we address the issue of, you know, should we or shouldn't we provide results to them, they, they probably are the, well, certainly are the one that has the most stake in it um, and are likely the only ones that will keep it, you know, throughout um, uh, and move it from system to system. Um, it was recognized that, uh, on Facebook. On Facebook. Uh, it was recognized that genomic uh, Clinical decision support requires um, frequent reinterpretation, revision, and maintenance, both of variants and its clinical actions, and that distinguishes it from non-genomic clinical decision support. I think that was Edda said that. The, the clinical actions, Edda, probably do get updated in non-genomic um, CDS, but the test result was not. Um, and, I, and I think that's what's, what's really un unusual about variants. Plus, the clinical actions are, are changing much more rapidly, most likely, than in other people. And there's an important uh, point related to that that Etta brought up, which is uh, because the result doesn't change, that's why the versioning in the EHR is, is an important thing to study related to the legal liability issue, because if you give, decision, uh, give a decision at a given point in time, what was the information you were using to make that decision? So that would tie in with the legal uh, dis uh, issues of return of results that were discussed earlier. So if you didn't know that a variant was, was pathogenic at the time, you can't be faulted, obviously, for not reporting it. Right. What you mean, Mark? Yes, uh, but without a versioning um, to say what, what, was, what was the decision made on at the time, then that can get lost in the shuffle of the uh, tort. Okay. Great. Um, implicit in that, but a lot of work is 
trying to standardize the components of that interpretation that this gene in this clinical scenario means this and that that's a coded value that you can store for the patient as opposed to running a version of a decision report report you know a rule every time but what you really want to do is be able to capture you know this person with a high metabolizer this person with a low metabolizer capture that interpretation in a codable form and that's you know what channeling Chris has talked about a lot is that when we're storing these we have we bounce back and forth between storing the genotypic detail and storing what the genotypic detail means. Yeah, but so codifying um, interpretation is this double-edged sword because yes. if the interpretation changes then you've got to do the equivalent of a global search and replace for all your additional <laughs> coded values you added, which did not represent the primary data, but rather a point in time assessment of it. So it's, you know, I think you could see it well, playing well, either way. It's not to debate the difficulty, yeah. yeah. but just to say that it's an issue. It is that that how, how to record these sequential interpretations mm -hmm. in a way that you can walk them back. Right. Okay. Um, I think the other thing, sort of just as a uh, general issue that was discussed really more on the other ones, is this issue of scaling beyond the eMERGE sites. Um, codifying our experience in a way that it can be translated more broadly. And just as a general... I'll be thing, done in about five minutes. Studying... <laughs> don't count. Studying... You know, we've, we've worked so hard to get these systems up and running what we have not had a chance to do then is to do the more traditional implementation science of what happens once you turn them on. So there's the, the studying the impact of what we've built in this version and what are the lessons of that. And another thing is the value, assessing the value of these genomic interventions. So the cost effectiveness study, yeah. the yeah. patient, you know, patient outcome. Data. Patient outcome. All right. Um, we also talked about uh, bringing clinical practice leaders, those who are familiar with okay. clinical workflow, and and Erwin made the, the yeah. particular point that that there are specific clinical workflows uh, in specific practice, practice settings, or even for specific physicians, and that does does complicate things, but it, it needs to be considered. Um, and the point was made that when, when we try to convince people to do this, we can fight patient safety issues. They need this point as well as cost. Um, uh, Steve was good mentioned um, the two D six and change control opiate safety. There are probably many uh, examples and others are more debatable. Some are more debatable than others. Um, I think so we we also brought in in that panel and earlier the need for the clinical practice leaders to understand understand the importance of capturing both the clinical and the genomic data. So I think clinical practice leaders have this general agreement that with the facts for decision curve that when we get into the thousands of genes and tens of thousands of proteins, no practitioner could possibly do this by what they read and remember. But I, but I think it's also the case that they don't see it yet. It hasn't happened. It's just a very tiny number of actionable things. And so at some point, there will be this tipping point where obviously you do this because genomic medicine is in the absence of anything else, is the driver for the need for systems approaches to decision support. But so, 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 Dan, so, the Dan, so Dan, I don't think we have to wait uh, until uh, everybody agrees with us. I, instead, I think we should uh, invite uh, influential leaders to workshop where they can tell us why they don't agree with us, with us or what it would take for them to agree with us. I think it's it would be that kind of tone that would uh, actually be uh, helpful to get them into such a meeting. Pulling back something that the Dan said very early on in the day, a part of EMR integration that we have not tackled yet is just-in-time phenotyping. 
the idea that the decision support drives data collection at the point of care in order to optimize the genotype phenotype match. Yeah, I, I think that that's I, I, I think that's a, a very useful construct, and I, I would almost flip around uh, what, that we bring. We have special meetings with the, the 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 leaders who are designing the EMRs that we integrate genomic science and clinical science and genetics into the the already piggyback it on the already transforming. EMRs that are being used to improve healthcare efficiency. I mean, there's a radical revolution going on now, and this is one. And you know, we ought to have a seat at that table to discuss this this aspect of clinical decision support as they're building uh, 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 all variations of that uh, of other types of clinical decision support with the purpose of efficiency. Yeah, um, so, so I think there are some who have seats at that, at that table, Mike, um, and I, I guess, you know, Ken Kawamoto has been, been involved in that, there, there are others as well, but um, I, I agree that, that that is an important issue. Or is there anything else that we want to add to this list here for, you know, as sort of critical emissions? Obviously, there will be other things that come to this. I mean, Kerry, you want to make sure that when you when you put something into the medical records, that it is an annotation uh, that is associated with it, that sort of uh, uh, is is automatically brought up uh, uh, to the attention of a of a clinician. This is sort of the way we manage the Epic system here. That if you put in something that influences warfarin, for example, you can't write a warfarin dose if that information is is on the individual. So. So the annotation there is critical. Yeah. Right, but only, you know, sort of that's a just-in-time thing, too, only if they're getting work there anyway. Right. So one but, thing that uh, uh, eMERGE may need to champion is um, the fight against the tendency to both do lossy compression, that is, do a lot of observations, report only a few, and throw the rest away, which clearly already exists, and the medical-legal um, incentives to delete data as soon as a statute allows you to get rid of it to reduce uh, malpractice liability. It's not a major theme, but it clearly in genomics has a much longer tail of, uh, on the, of implications for health and well-being of in individual patients than does, say, an x-ray result or standard clinical labs. Okay, great. We have one more. Hogan's comment um, made me uh, think of something that we didn't represent here, and that is setting different types of clinical decision support for effectiveness. You know, again, he brought up the hard stop in the clinical workflow, uh, and we talked earlier about the fact that that is not always necessarily a desirable thing. So I'd like to see some uh, representation of exploration of different ways to do decision support to implement genomic medicine and compare their effectiveness. Okay. So I'm not sure where it goes, but the figuring out how to leverage the other elephants that are running around, including the CCD for meaningful use and the CDRN from Macquarie, that there will be massive piles of potential phenotyping data in new, at least semi-standardized formats that will be coming online during the period of eMERGE 3. Okay, so we have quite a little menu here for, <laughs> for one little study guy. Uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. We will try to get that. that okay. All right, next panel. Um, so this, this is the last one. So this was the general medicine and pediatrics. Um, there was a lot of discussion around the incongruity in pediatric versus adult phenotypes. Um, while that was seen as a, as a disadvantage, it was also seen as a strength. Um, the question was asked, is MERS uh, pediatric component large enough? Right, that's a, a reasonable question. Um, you know, is, is any study ever large enough? But large enough for what? I think is the, the next question. Um, and, and perhaps we need to define, you know, what it is that we feel that the pediatric component can and should do, and then where um, it might need to be larger or smaller or whatever. Okay, Kevin commented about the big size. I mean, you have three pediatric sites, which is a large adult hospital, but has a few more pediatrics. And I mean, I think in Vanderbilt, they're starting to so it may be that within these sites, you're not just relying on just, I mean, we're like three great hospitals, but so yeah, <laughs> aside from that, I'm just saying that, that this issue of size, and I think there's also advantages if you can bring in the other sites bringing more 
pediatric patients because then if it's more of a longitudinal component that the pediatric hospitals get a cure issue about they don't have. So yeah, and I think that there was always Sorry, always the hope that um, that you know that once you had three the three best children's hospitals and in the world, in right the now, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, that that then the, the adult sites would say, oh, this is great, and we'll get on the bandwagon. I yeah. think some of them are starting to. I think that they're just trying to finish the driving the side component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and John made the point, you know, can we encourage the adult sites to come more toward the pediatrics in, in some of the phenotypes that may not be as, as, as much interest to them, but probably do have implications in adults as well as children's developmental disabilities. Yeah, just say, if we're trying to do that. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> so you can talk to John, um, but that's good. They are. I mean, yeah. we're yeah. testing a, a child, you know, a pediatric phenotype right now in our so, adult population. Which, which one just true? Atrophic um, dermatitis. Yeah, and it's just think coming to the special developmental phenotype. I mean, you know, those are not things that go away with time. There's a lot of, you know, those, those are ones that we can do an autism, but those are really much job to explore in adults because... Right. Definitely. All right. So I added even more. Even more. Okay. Good. Because it is ongoing now. Sorry about that. Um, you didn't speak up when John said that. I know. So, I know. Okay. Peggy, you know, I'm trying here. All right. So, <laughs> Uh, the point was made that children with adult diseases early in life are, are likely to have a high genetic load and are very interesting to study. I, I know that point is not missed on pediatricians, it may be missed on some of the adults. Um, uh, oh, this is, this is uh, Steve Lear. I, I'd like to uh, uh, propose that maybe um, children have uh, uh, pediatric diseases and, and adults have pediatric diseases that uh, simply occur later in life because they have a lower genetic <laughs> It takes more environmental influence for the uh, disease to manifest. And in fact, obesity is a classic, would be a classic yeah. example of that. Early childhood obesity versus later on. Genetics is the gun, it stays there. So diplomatic. Uh, yeah, all right. So we'll, we'll, put it, we'll, make it, we'll make it more articulate, Steve. But, um, but obviously, there's the, you know, the converse of that. Uh, maybe it's, it's more of a, you know, the, the more uh, environmental load. Okay. Um, TMDs, I think, were recognized to be an untapped resource throughout Emerge. Um, I don't know if Elizabeth, Q, and Kim Davini are still on, um, but we did do a lot of soul searching early in Emerge about can you know can we measure CMDs, and if you know it was determined that we didn't have algorithms that were really reproducible enough. Kim or Elizabeth, are you still there? Yep. I mean, I think we can. David Crossland's looking at it, and we can certainly look at it again. It, it's still going to be difficult to get it out of these data, but it's, it may be worth looking at again. And I know David's trying. Mm -hmm. but, but sequencing gets it much better, doesn't it? Yes, sequencing absolutely will get you finer regions. Yeah. And we're, we're we're looking at larger um, copy number variants than you would look at with sequence. But nonetheless, in Emerge 1, we were allowed, we were able to connect copy number variation to, to bone marrow dysplasias and even show a longitudinal that they had the copy number, acquired copy number variant mm -hmm. before they had the bone marrow dysplasia using right. the longitudinal data. Mm -hmm. So those were larger things than you find by sequence, but I, I think it's still useful. And, and, I, and David is very aggressively pursuing this, and I know Instacart group is very interested as well. But, but it, it's fair to say that in me, it, it has not been rolled out network of ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it hasn't been, you know, there are many other questions one could ask about CMD. Absolutely. Are, are not yeah. um, pediatrics has been underrepresented in genomics, and we should consider more um, uh, gene by environment data collection in children. I, I think that the point that pediatrics is underrepresented, you know, is that, is that we have a, a real strength in emerge in having pediatrics, and we should, should continue to capitalize on that. We should find ways to really emerge and the new board sequencing projects. So I was delighted that. Um, that we had uh, Dr. Spall and Nuffbaum on the on the call, who were two of the PIs in those programs. And we have one. And, 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 and you guys have one of those Yeah. So, so that's three of the four now are are intimately familiar yeah. with with Emerge. Um, we should try to target conditions for genomic analysis that have early clinical utility in children. So in children in particular, it, it seemed to be felt that the, the kind of low-hanging fruit, the, the um, demonstration of clinical utility hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, I'm not convinced it isn't, you know, coding in breastfeeding mothers, but um, it could be something else. Um, and, and the point was made that, that Emerge is uniquely positioned to lead uh, translation into children, which I think we may be among, uh, certainly genomic translation, we're, I think, the only group that might be doing that. And then the question was, you know, shouldn't we consider birth defects? But I think that's not something that has been addressed by the pediatric groups. Uh, violent objections to anything that's here? Again, birth defects are still present. 
Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> Although, some of them may be surgically correct. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually very interesting. We find that the patients like, who have heart disease, like the parents, once they been corrected, they say they don't have to be yeah. hard to correct. Right. Yeah. 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 So there is something about when it's correct, you don't have it. Yeah. 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 So. No, I don't have that. So there are, are right. exactly. 15 minutes later. Any, any, any uh, major omissions on this? Hey, yeah. Nope. Oh, oh, no. Okay. All right. So, so I think we're done. Um, and at this point, I, let me just sort of give you an idea of what we will try to do soon, um, which is to, to try to come up with a summary. This is not a, a you know a transcript of this meeting, but at least the major points, the major things we identified as opportunities plus challenges for emerge, and in, including some of the things that we didn't uh, you know that we can't do in emerge and shouldn't try to. Um, one of the things we didn't do was set priorities for these, and it would be helpful to try to do that. Maybe the emerge committee can address that some in the next couple of days. Um, and, and then we will, you know, um, also send out these, these slides and have you guys yeah, comment on it. Okay. Anything else we should be doing? Not. Let me thank everybody. I uh, apologize for Washington's inhospitable weather, but uh, we all really handled it quite, quite well. And, and I was, I was delighted that this went as well as it did. Uh, all right, great. No, I appreciate everybody's uh, flexibility. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Did well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.